1 Kings chapter 3. Some more interesting stuff. We've, we're, when it comes to understanding Solomon, this is one of the chapters we probably hear about, at least one of the stories, the, kind of one of the most famous stories of King Solomon we get to hear about today. Uh, so Solomon loves the Lord, keeps his commandments. The Lord appears to Solomon, promises him, promises him a wise and understanding heart. He judges between two harlots, determines who is the mother of a child. So a really interesting story that we get to learn. That I think, like I said, it's probably the most common story, one of the most common stories of King Solomon's reign. Verse 1, And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. So let's just pause here for a second and look at this. There's a lot really to unpack in verse 1. So at this time, it says that King Solomon is building his own house. He is improving the palace, building his kingdom out more than David had. Uh, he's also wanting to build the house of the Lord. So remember, David had desires to do this, and he had plans in place of what to do to build it. But God told him not to build the house of the Lord because David had spent so much time dealing with bloodshed and war that that would not be appropriate. So he was not allowed to build the house of the Lord. You can go look in 2 Samuel for that. So now we get Solomon. His, David has passed on those plans most likely to Solomon, given them to him to do. Solomon now wants to build an actual temple to God, basically. Uh, and he's building the wall of Jerusalem, so he's fortifying the city. He's making it a stronger, more fortified place as well, and, uh, which is what he should do as a king to protect his kingdom. And take care of things. While he is doing this, he makes an alliance basically with Egypt. Now, it was quite common back then, if you wanted to make an alliance with another country, you married one of their daughters. You married a princess. And so this was kind of seen, we see this played out all the time in ancient medieval movies and times and stuff like that of where, oh, the princess is kind of the pawn of the kingdom and she gets to go be married to the kings of other nations, basically, to uh, pull alliances together, if you will, basically, to kind of help these nations work together. Uh, and we have to understand, too, that after the reign of King David, there's definitely a reputation for Israel in the, in the area. Uh, I mean, because David practically never lost a battle. So even about even against insurmountable odds, even against armies that were way better prepared and fortified than his, he still won. So I'm pretty sure there's a reputation among Israel or, or among the area that Israel is a force to be reckoned with. Now, this leads us to some interesting questions, though, uh, because there's a couple of things that we need to discuss here. One is, of course... Uh, who is this pharaoh in Egypt? And why would he do this? You see, in Egypt, their culture was that the women, uh, the princesses, basically, of pharaoh are the ones that establish the bloodlines of the kings. So pharaoh was the Egyptian version of king, basically, just like Caesar is the Roman version of king. Um, that, in, in fact, Josephus even talks about that in his books. Uh, but in in Egypt, it was it was the mother, the wife, basically of Pharaoh, who established the bloodline. Her daughters would be the ones that would carry the bloodline. So if you wanted to be Pharaoh, you married a daughter of Pharaoh. That's how you became king. You didn't automatically become king because you were the son of Pharaoh. You married your sister, and that made you Pharaoh. So women had a much bigger influence in Egypt, in Egypt's history, than in most places in Mesopotamia. Uh, they had a lot more rights. They had a lot more uh, freedoms and opportunities that sometimes wasn't granted to them in other places in, in, you know, around ancient Mesopotamia at the time. So why in the world, if this is the case, if, you're, if you establish ruling in Egypt by marrying an Egyptian princess, why would a pharaoh allow Solomon to marry an Egyptian princess? Because wouldn't that put him in an opportunity to usurp power? 
Now we see this in times when there's a there's a couple times in Egyptian history where a priest wants to become pharaoh, as in the case the around King Tut. Okay, King Tut's dad was not liked. He basically he basically fired all the priests uh, at the time and tried to change Egyptian religion from a polytheistic religion to a monotheistic religion. He tried to move the capital. Uh, away from Memphis, he tried to change things around and build his own city out in the desert and usurp, basically just just get rid of it. We don't need these priests anymore. We don't need any of them. We're going to go in our own direction and be a monotheist nation rather than a polytheist nation, which is instead of worshiping many gods, we're going to worship one god. And he was not seen as uh, a good, he was seen as the heretic pharaoh. So they actually scribbled off his name and banished him from history. Uh, and then, but he had a son, and his son became a successor because he married his, his sister, of course, and they he became king. He was King Tut, the most famous of the Egyptian kings, the pharaohs, uh, not because he was anybody spectacular as a ruler, but because we know a lot about him. Um, and the reason is, it's so weird how this works out in history. King Tut uh, was a child pharaoh basically. So the Grand Vizier, the main priest, basically, that was the kind of the right-hand man or assistant to the pharaoh, he basically ruled Egypt because Tut, King Tut was too young to rule Egypt. When King Tut was about 18 years old and he could rule Egypt, uh, he did. He took over, and so the priest had to go back to his lower position and, and couldn't overstate couldn't supersede what the king said or kind of convince the king to go a certain way. The king made it up his own mind now. So uh, King Tut was eventually killed. Uh, they believe he was assassinated, probably by poison, slowly poisoned him, and he died. Uh, king Tut's wife and sister used to write, was that, they discovered these. They, she was writing letters to somebody in another kingdom uh, that talked about how she was hoping this other kingdom would come save her and help her because she feared that the Grand Vizier was going to, when Tut was dead, basically take her to wife and become the pharaoh, and she didn't want him to become pharaoh. And that's exactly what he did. He be, he married King Tut's wife, and he became pharaoh because he was now married to the bloodline, the main bloodline, and he, he got in there, basically. It's a crazy story. They tried to hide King Tut from history, by burying his chamber, they wanted they couldn't to save face with the people in Egypt. They couldn't basically just wipe him out and, and make him disappear from from history. They did that with his dad. They actually didn't bury him in the tomb of the kings. They buried him off in the desert, kind of by himself. And and probably he had his own wishes to go that way because he didn't want to be seen as part of the rest of the kings. Um, and then of course they kind of got rid of his other city, which we have now found in archaeology. At least what was left of it. There wasn't much there, anyways. Uh, the the desert sands have reclaimed most of it. But they buried King Tut behind a tomb of another king, another pharaoh, and basically made it look like there was no tomb there. So here's what's fascinating: is when the tomb raiders, which were most likely the guys that were hired, the laborers that were hired to build the tombs, they knew where to get into the tombs. They knew the secret chambers. They knew how to get past the defenses and things that were put in place to protect the chambers. So when political strife went crazy, the kingdoms were falling apart, all kinds of problems happened. Where did they go? They need money. They knew where the wealth of the kings were. So they would raid these tombs and take all the gold and jewelry and things out of them. So we don't have a lot of those artifacts left in Egyptian uh, uh, history because they were raided. Those tombs were raided for thousands of years, except King Tut's, because they didn't know where it was. Nobody, they didn't have record of where it was. They left it alone. They wanted to hide him from history. They had to give him a proper burial because he was a pharaoh and he was legitimate. And they believed that pharaohs became gods or sons of God. And so, if you wanted to get into heaven, you had to be, deal nicely with the with the pharaohs, basically. So they still gave him his burial, but they hid his burial. And now he's like the most famous king of Egypt or pharaoh of Egypt ever because we have all of his stuff. The whole reason we have his gold face mask and the gold sarcophagus and everything is because ancient Egypt tried to hide him from history. 
And by doing that, they preserved him for history. It's so crazy. It's a cool story. But anyways, I digress. So Egyptian history is a really fun thing to study. So here's the thing with Solomon, okay? He is now marrying, according to this, a princess of Egypt. Uh, like I said, this is probably because Israel is seen as a force to be reckoned with in the area. Now, when we look at this from a timeline standpoint, okay, this is happening, you know, 1047 to about 1000 BC-ish, sometime in there, when Solomon's taking over from David, ruling and doing all of this. That puts him at about the time during the third intermediary period of Egypt. So when you look at Egyptian history, you have to realize there's the Old Kingdom, basically, which is more of the original, some of the first dynasties of Egypt come in. And then there was that there they that lasts for a couple of you know, several hundred years. Then there's what's known as the first intermediary period. And this is a period of time when basically Egyptians didn't rule Egypt. They were taken over by other people and ruled. And then eventually Egyptians revolted and got the kingdom back, thus beginning the Middle Kingdom. Then there's the Middle Kingdom, and then there was a second intermediary period. And this intermedi intermediary period somewhat corresponds with when Israel was around Egypt at the time. Some people say that the, uh, the Hyksos or the other groups that were there, the non-Egyptian foreigners were there. Maybe they were trying to usurp power over Egypt. And that's when uh, the Pharaoh suppressed them and put them into slavery and began uh, the, the third, not the third, but the, the middle, after the middle kingdom, the new kingdom. And the new kingdom runs, and then there's a third in intermediary period where, again, lots of political strife, lots of challenges are happening. Uh, Egypt is kind of falling apart. They're not seen as a world power, and they don't really recover after this third intermediary period a lot because uh, they're heading into decline. They're eventually going to get into the Ptolemies where the Greeks take over, and uh, that's when Cleopatra is around, and those, those stories as Rome comes in and basically... Egypt no longer becomes much of a world-dominating power. They just kind of become their own. They still stay a country, but they're not the same as they used to be. Uh, so this is a challenge that's going to happen. Uh, during this third intermedi intermediary period, most of the rulers, instead of ruling from southern Egypt or upper Egypt, they kind of move to, to the northern end of the kingdom or lower Egypt. Okay, you have to realize how the geographics of Egypt work is Upper Egypt is in the south. Lower Egypt is in the north. Okay? That's just how it runs. The, the Nile runs from the south to the north, basically. And that sounds kind of contradictory, but that's the geography of how it runs. So Lower Egypt is the, the, the Nile Delta area. So Tanis was the, a common place for the rulers to live, uh, which would put them in closer contact with Israel. Uh, the problem is, is again, there, there actually is no record in Egypt of an Egyptian princess being married off. In fact, we have in Egyptian history uh, at least two times where uh, it, one was with Babylon and another one was with uh, the Midianites, if I remember right, where they requested uh, an Egyptian princess to form an alliance. They sent one of their princesses to marry Pharaoh and they requested a uh, Egyptian princess to marry them so that they could form an alliance. And in both times, basically what happened was the pharaoh said, hey, thanks for another wife, I appreciate that, but no, we're not going to send one of ours because that's just wrong. Uh, so they didn't, <laughs> and so it didn't really work as well as they thought. Um, so why would Solomon be different? We don't know. Uh, there are some other challenges that maybe the maybe the timing and historicity of the, the stories of Solomon aren't completely correct. It could be the Jewish Bible has some incorrectness in it. Uh, it could be the, the Egyptian records have some incorrectness in it as well. We have to always realize that history is written by the victors. So history isn't completely truthful in all things. That's why if you read Egyptian history, it always looks amazing. Why? Because they don't talk about their faults. They only preserve their victories. So there's, you know, you can only learn so much about Egyptians from Egyptians. You kind of have to look at everybody around them and their perception of Egyptians to get a more well-rounded view of what Egyptians were like. So there's kind of this debate. Is, did this really happen? Did it not? We're not sure. 
there's there is some debate on this this whether this happened or not. So we're not quite sure. Um, so we'll see how this works out. Um, so let's jump on. Let's keep moving. Verse two: Only the people sacrificed in high places, because there was no house built unto the name of the Lord until those days. So people will go into these altars up in like on Mount Moriah and other places to, to do their sacrifices. Uh, because they kind of got away from using the tabernacle that Moses had put together, the, the traveling tabernacle. Uh, verse 3, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there. So they're saying that they, basically David did follow God, and he was the one that went and sacrificed in these high places. So everybody else kind of started to do it because the king was doing it, is maybe what was happening here. But the king, meaning Solomon, went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon that altar. Now, this is the important thing to look at. Okay, Gibeon is the place where they where they put up the temple, uh, the, ta the moving tabernacle that Moses had had the Israelites construct that moving tabernacle, Gibeon is the final place where that tabernacle stopped moving. They set it up. They didn't take it down anymore. So that was kind of seen. That's where the Holy of Holies was. That's where the priests would come, and they had the gates and things, the tabernacle congregation and stuff. So David kind of went away from that, using that tabernacle a little bit. Everybody else kind of went away from it for a little bit. But Solomon said, no, we're going back. we got to do this right. So he went back and he offered his sacrifices there and was blessed because of his righteousness with this. Verse 5, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. So he's having this vision where he's seeing God, and God is asking him, What is it that you want? Verse 6, And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? So Solomon is really trying to do things right. He's trying to get off on the right foot. He's trying to move forward. And he realizes he feels inadequate in his calling as king. Uh, which makes sense. I think I think anybody would feel that way, honestly. So he's asking for discernment. Help me to know how to judge these people properly. Verse 10, And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that thou, which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. So God grants unto him, uh, just pausing here for a second, he says, look, this is wonderful. This is a good thing. You didn't ask, oh, God, can you bless me with more wealth? Can you bless me with a bigger army to protect my people? Can you, uh, you know, minimize my enemies? Can you grant me extra life so I can be king longer? None of those things that, were, that would be quite selfish, but common for a, a ruler to ask for, basically, who wants to rule longer, basically, and be stronger as a ruler. Again, all selfish things that a ruler would ask. And he says, look, you didn't ask for anything selfish. You asked, how can I best 
be a servant to my people. That's really what it comes down to. And I think this is great. This is a key, honestly, to wealth. If you're, if you're using the scriptures to try to look for wealth, this is one of those keys for wealth, okay? Realizing that the more people you can bless and help, the more wealth you can make, the more you can be blessed yourself. So it's not the perfect way to think about it, but this is kind of an example of, of that, basically. So it, it's not uncommon with Zig Ziglar's famous philosophy that if, if you want to, you know, to get what you want, you just need to help enough other people get what they want, and you'll get what you want. And it kind of goes along with those same lines. But God is blessing him and saying, look, because you asked for the righteous thing, I'm not only going to give you the righteous thing, but I'm going to give you wealth also. I'm going to, still, I'm going to bless you even more. Now verse 14 is an admonition that he gets. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. So that is the if statement. If you keep my commandments. So you, Solomon, have agency to choose what you want to do. I've given you some gifts to help you, but you have to exercise them in a righteous way. If you do, I will lengthen out your days. Okay, And he, he's referring to David, that David did mostly good things. David wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination. He did make some mistakes, but he did do some things good. And so that's, that's why he's bringing them up as an example. Verse 15, And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And one woman said, O oh, my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and which wasn't a common. If you weren't married as, a, as an adult woman, you were kind of stuck in life you kind of you had to have a, a man around to help you with things you you know a lot of uh, women were established by getting married and these were two women who weren't married basically why they weren't we don't know uh, but they weren't married and so of course women coming together to help each other out in this situation where they're kind of they're not given full opportunities to do things in society they have to band together and help each other out. So that's what they're, they're living together, to help each other out. And it says, And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. So they were both pregnant. They were living together to help each other out, to, to work together. And they both delivered their babies relatively close to each other, basically. Verse 9, And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. So the baby was laying next to her. She rolled over, ended up smashing the baby. And the baby probably suffocated and died. Verse 20, And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. When I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. So this is the situation. She realized that she woke up and went, oh my gosh, I've been laying on my baby. My baby's dead. He's not breathing. Oh my heck. What's going on? And then she realizes this is a bad thing. But then she realizes, too, this other woman had a baby. I'm going to switch babies, basically. Uh, which sounds crazy, but not the craziest thing you've ever heard from people, honestly. Let's face it. Uh, so this happened, okay? And so she's trying to pawn off her dead baby to the other woman. So the other woman wakes up in the morning. Oh, it's morning. i got to take care of my baby. Let's get him ready to breastfeed. And realizes the baby's dead. Then dawns on her, wait a minute, this isn't my baby. So... Uh, it's pretty safe to say a woman knows the baby that she is giving birth to. Uh, she knows who's her baby. You know, that's, that's important. So the other woman's trying to pawn them off. So verse 22, And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. So they're arguing 
whose baby is the one that's alive, basically. They're both arguing, have the exact same argument. So now this is a challenge. They both know the truth of what's going on. The problem is, is one woman is lying and the other one's not, but they're using the same argument. So this is the challenge, the predicament that Solomon is in. Is how do I know which woman is lying and which woman is telling the truth? Verse 23, Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is dead, and my son is living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. So this is his answer. And you've got to admit, this is a bit of a crazy answer. But we know where he, we kind of know where Solomon's going. He's not trying to kill a baby. Because obviously, well, look, if you're fighting over one baby, let's just cut the baby in half and give you each. Basically saying, both of you are going to have a dead baby. It, it's going to be, it really, you know, on, on face value, what Solomon is proposing is preposterous because that means the baby's dead. They both have dead babies. So that's what he's trying to, he's using this as an example to try to figure out who's really the mom, who really loves this baby, who wants to see this baby live. Verse 26, Then spake the woman, whose the living child was unto the king. For her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, O my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. So now Solomon has realized which mom loves the baby. The one that said, Don't kill the baby. Let the baby live. It's better that the baby live as her son, I will let go of my rights to him so long as he can live. And the other one's like, fine, kill the baby. I'm happy with that. Why? Because it's not her son. Her son's already dead. So now he understands the motivations between the two. Verse 27, Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. So he didn't intend to slay the baby. He was using this, again, to find the motivations. Brilliant, brilliant strategy. Really great way to do things. Uh, verse 28, And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. This is a pretty smart king to figure that out. I don't know if we, you know, put in the comments what you think if you heard about a king that had this kind of wisdom to discern out who was the truthful person. That's pretty good. That is a really good thing. So, uh, some interesting stuff we get to learn about Solomon and what's going on. Maybe some inaccuracies with that one verse at the beginning about uh, Egypt. We, we don't know for sure. Again, we can't say that Israel's history is false or that Egyptian history is false. We're not quite sure where the issue lies in there. Um, there are stories of ancient uh, Egyptian pharaohs that had actually taken some of the cities that were destroyed, uh, Israelite cities that were destroyed, built them up and gave them to their daughters as a wedding gift. Um, but they're, they're kingdoms that don't necessarily line up exactly with, with Solomon's time, but they're, they're something similar to them. So we don't know if the timeline's off, we don't know if the stories are off, but that's just the way it is. That's why Article of Faith number eight is worded the way it is. We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as translated correctly. And we can really say the same for any document that has not been given to us through the gift and power of God like the Book of Mormon was. So, or the Doctrine and Covenants for that matter as well, since we have a more original copy of all that. So uh, that's just an important thing to understand as we study through the Old Testament uh, and try to understand the historicity of the Old Testament too. So some pretty interesting things. We look forward to seeing you in the next chapter as we continue to see this wisdom of Solomon.